So if you ask the player and he says, hey, I, I'm thinking about my Olaf the Ceaseless Hunger trigger, right? When my opponent asks me if I can fetch, right? Even though he's tanking on this Olaf the Ceaseless Hunger, he's still in this feedback process loop, right? So the guy says, I'd like to fetch, and the guy says, okay, all right? So we have an acknowledgement there. So our important information is that we have this player, he's pausing, he's thinking, right? And then, wait, he's acknowledged the fetch, and now they resolved it. So now we have a different set of information. We can't then go back and say, oh, I want to, I'm going to get the exiles and things. All right? We, we missed that. We're going to move on. Right? So when your spidey sense does start to tangle, we're going to get to this last one. And this is really important. I'm going to mention this again later on. We want to separate the players. And we want to do that as soon as possible. Especially if, number two here, they do not agree on reality. Okay? So we have these two player stories, and they conflict in some way, in some shape, in some form. So we want to take these guys and we want to get them away from each other. Because we want the purity of their story. We want to understand exactly what from their perspective without the taint of their opponent, right? Because as soon as their opponent says something, ah, uh, their story is tainted and it's going to be changed and adapted based on what their opponent said. So, back to what I was saying before and uh, the question that we had earlier, we're going to gather each player's side of the story, right? So, we're going to talk to each player, we're going to do that in turn, right? And it doesn't matter which player you start with, right? We want to make sure that we hear both players, right? Each player has a side of the story and we want to make sure that each player feels that they have been heard. That again goes back to effective communication, right? Make sure that each player you know, has a chance to offer their side of the story. So there's when we get on a little bit later, we can talk about several different things that you can do to make sure that each player feels like you have given them ample opportunity to present their side of the story, especially when you're going down this road. Alright? Because if a player doesn't feel like you have heard them out fully, that's when you're going to run into trouble and they're going to be very upset with you later on once you decide and you get into your decision time. Alright? So, this one here, this one, I can't stress this one enough, and I, and I know this, this one comes from the absolute master, Eric Shukan. Alright? You ever talk to him about investigations, he will tell you this piece of information. Ask questions with known answers. He might say, well, I will be there. How do I know what the answer is? Well, you have the answers because you're talking to the players. The players are telling you information, especially that first initial story. That's, that's, that's your baseline. That's gold for you. Because they're going to tell you, hey, you know, when I was thinking about this, I was doing this, and I tried to, you know, uh, do this. And now, now you've got known answers. You know, you've got known information. So you go back to the other guy and say, especially when they're separated, this, this is a fantastic technique to use. You go to the other guy and you say, hey, uh, I was wondering when this happened, what did you do? Right? But you know because the other guy said what they did. Right? Now you get from their perspective. And so now he's going to tell you, a, or he or she's going to tell you a story. They're going to spin you a story and they're going to tell you something. And you can see how the realities match up, whether they agree or not. And you can start to pick apart, all right, so I've got this story from this guy and I've got this story from this part, all right, and they don't match up. How is it that well, I can get these two divergent realities from this one situation? And you're you are going to have to make up your mind. It's going to be something that when you get to the table, especially if you're the head judge, that, that's going to be where you need to come in and say, all right, I, I think we've landed into X. And X may be just a mystery. Or it may be we have something deeper where we have a player who's cheating. So 
And now we're going to talk about considerations. So when we get to a table, what are the kind of things that we talk or we, we want to consider, right? I've, I've touched on some of this stuff already, like Kevin Defray over there. He's thinking. Right? So we want to we want to we want to consider current policy. Right? This is this this is it. This is it. Right? We get to one of my examples a little bit later on. This, this is going to lead you to the right answer. But I guarantee most of you will already go to the wrong answer. So we want to we want a way to provide evidence, right? I've got stories from multiple players. I can have stories from spectators. Never forget that you can ask questions of spectators, people who are around and watching other judges. If there are judges, there's a shadow, right? You have at least minimally you have three people at that call: the judge, the responding judge, which may be yourself. You can certainly ask questions of yourself. Not a problem there. And the two players. Right? But you may also have spectators and other judges. Right? If you especially if you weren't the responding judge. So if you're a head judge of a PPTQ and you have a floor judge who is there and they come to you and they say, Hey, I've got these two players and they've done this. And this is happening. I know this is you gotta think about this in abstract. We'll have some more concrete examples later on. But you gotta start to think, right? Alright, why why is it that this could have happened? So we want to weigh this out, right? Right? We don't want ideally we don't want our, to land our players into a disqualification. We don't want to disqualify our players. That's not it's not fun. It's not fun for you, it's certainly not fun for them. We want our players to have fun and we want them to keep playing some magic, but some people out there do things that we don't want them to do. And that makes it not fun. So we have to remove them. Okay? The other thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we have some level of confidence. I put certainty up here. But you want to be confident that your picture of reality, because that's what you're building, you're building a picture of reality based on the stories that are all provided to you. What do you think actually happened? You want to have some level of certainty that that is the actual reality. And it may not match either player's reality. So keep that in mind. You can come to a point where you have discrepancy on life totals. Well, one player thinks they're at 16, the other player thinks you're at 12, but really, if you walk them back and you go through what the game say happens, they're actually at 14. That, that totally can happen. Right? The right answer is 14. Now, you don't you don't always have to come to that, right? Usually one answer is going to be correct versus the other, but you want to keep these things in mind when you build out the reality, especially things with discrepancies, use the life pad, right? Take control of these things. The other thing you want to consider, and this is this is really, really important, is the clock. So when you when you get called over to a ruling, what's the first thing you're going to be looking at? Wow. The clock. Because we want to keep it early. We want to make sure how much time we take. So we don't want to spend 10 minutes at a table before we ever get the head drive. Bad. Not, 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 not the thing we want to do. Right? Because that means already, before we've gotten the head drive, we spent 10 minutes. We have a 10 minute extension. Now, the head judge is going to come and do perform their own investigation. And that may also take 10 minutes. So now we've extended the length of our tournament by 20 minutes, which is a disservice to literally everybody, especially if you don't disqualify a player. So everybody in the tournament now has to wait 20 minutes. So if your spidey sense goes off, gather as much information as possible and go get that head judge. You want to ask questions. Ask questions, ask a lot of questions. So, now we're going to talk about different techniques. Right? So, when we approach the table, right, this is actually going to be a bit of a step back. We're not talking specifically about investigations here, we're talking more about uh, sort of a, a diffusing, a conflict, right? 
We want to we want to explain the player to the goal, right? What's our goal? I said it earlier. What's that? Here to help you. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Here to help you, but we want. Uh, ultimately, that is a greater goal, but it's not. It's not the ideal goal we did when we, we have in mind when we, we get to a player we put your name on the end. But say your name, people. Please. Uh, Olivier? Yeah. Uh, fix their problem. All right. Well, well, what does that what does that do for us, Trevor? We want to get players to play magic. Boom. There it is. We want players to play magic again. I, I actually said it earlier, so I throw a softball in there. <laughs> So yeah, we want players to play magic again. We want them to play magic as we want to get them. We don't want to be over there. We want to minimize the amount of time that we're over there, right? So they have some issue that's come up during the course of their game, and we want to fix it as fast as possible. Now that doesn't mean we want to just throw out willy nilly some answer. Take take your time and do it right. But if you can do it quickly. And efficiently, then make, let's let's keep that in mind, right? So we want to explain the players the goal. Hey, I uh, uh, I I see that there's uh, some issue here, and I'd like to assist you with that. You know, how can I how can I help you with that? All right. So they're going to tell you a story, and you want to you want to align the players to this goal, right? Especially if you're in a mode where players think that there's something fishy going on. Okay. So you want to separate them. You want to get them on, basically on your side. You want both players to be on your side, and that can be very difficult when there is contention, right? So you can do that in a couple of different ways. Again, some of this goes back to what Elliot was talking about with his communication. We can drop to their level, right? So if you lower their level down to the table, that neutralizes you as an authority. You bring yourself down to them. So now you are on their level, you are equating yourself to them, which is very friendly. So keep that in mind. You may, that might be a tactic that you want to use, right? So a lot of the times that actually works great, especially for things like a missed trigger, right? You come to the table, you realize, oh, they've explained to you, now we have this missed trigger. You come down, you lower the level, and it disarms players, right? Because you're on their level. You're, you can make eye contact with them very easily. The other thing that you might want to do, especially in a contentious, uh, when you have contentious players, you might want to retain, remain standing. That gives you a point of authority. You are above them. You are above the players. So they need to look up to you in order to speak to you. Right? So when you have players, and you have players who are and not contentious, right? Especially in a, in a situation where you, you might be disqualifying one of these players, they're, they're probably going to be fighting already, right? So if you are remaining standing, then the players have to not only do they have to they have to turn their head and look up. So they're turning their head and looking up to you. And if you've ever tried to fight with somebody while they're not looking at you, it doesn't really work too well. So. You can diffuse the situation that you laugh, but like it, it doesn't work, right? And it helps diffuse the situation because the focus of the player is now not their opponent, who they are frustrated with. It's you, who, with what you you've already tried to do, which is explain the goal to the players, to get them on your side. You are empathetic, with, right? So they are. They are now focusing on you, and they they will explain themselves to you, such that you 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 don't have an argument this way, and it diffuses the situation. The other thing that we can do, and like I said, I would mention this again, is we can separate them. Get them get them away from each other. Physical separation does not only does it do wonders. For diffusing a situation that is contentious, but it also gets us away from that situation where players will change each other's stories. Right? Yeah. yeah, I know CJ had a hand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll give you a second. No, I was pointing over to CJ. Oh, all right. This is Ben CJ. Uh, how do you feel about sitting next to the players? I don't know on the drop. 
You can do that. Yeah, that's fine. What, 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 what this, the point of this one here is to make the player feel, feel comfortable. Get them engaged. You are on their side. Right? That's because, because you, have, you have this mutual goal. Everybody has that mutual goal. We want you playing matches. I don't want to be over here as much as you don't really want me over here, but I would like to solve the problem that you're having right now. Uh, when it comes to separating the players, I noticed that if you have really good board covers, you can uh, ask your manager to sit at the table and watch this. You're, you're getting ahead of The player is very happy and very comfortable. You're getting ahead of me. We'll get to that. <laughs> Um, right. So, I mentioned this earlier, and I'll mention it again. You want to have players take turns telling their story. And it really doesn't matter which player goes first, okay? If you have one player who's like, oh, 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 and they're talking, you can have them go first. It's not a problem. And what you want to do is you want to look at the players. Make eye contact with the player, especially when you're explaining something to them. So if I ask Joe a question, I'm looking at Joe, and Joe knows that I'm engaging him, right? I'm not just talking, I'm not talking above Joe. I'm not talking over here. Hey, Joe, how are you? Right? I'm looking at Joe, and I say, Joe, all right, can you please explain to me? what exactly has happened in this game. And now Joe is going to go into it. And then I turn to his opponent. Now I'm not looking at Joe anymore, and that cuts him off. Again, we have we can diffuse this, because Joe's going to speak at the side of my face. And if Joe continues to talk, we can say, hold on. Hold on. You've had your, you've had your time to, to speak. I'd like to speak to your opponent and give him opportunity. And it's really, really hard, again, going back to talking to somebody's eyes, somebody's face, it's hard to also have an argument with somebody while there's a third party going, shh, 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 hold on, shh, and keeping, you know, interjecting that you stay quiet every time. It's really hard. Try it sometimes, you know. So, another thing that you can do, this is, this is more physical is that we can insert ourselves between the players. So, this doesn't, you know, obviously a lot of times we come to a table, right? And I like, I like the table on the They're my favorite. Because I can actually just literally do this. I get in between the two players, because I'm on the end of the table, and I duck down, and I'm here. And the players now have to look at me, and I'm physically in between them, right? So they want to have an argument, they can't really argue. They have to turn to me, right? For the middle, for the middle tables, other things you can do, or you can actually to physically get in between, is you can physically come inside and lean on, lean in, and that that cuts it off. That cuts off any argument that these two players can have. Because you say, hey, hold on, guys, I'd like I'd like to figure out exactly what's happening. This. This particular conversation isn't constructive, so I'd like to turn it around a little bit into something more constructive and understand what the players, you know, are having issues. So this one here is also goes back to the master air shoe can himself. We're going to inquire about collateral. Okay, for reference, and at the end of my talk, I have some references to uh, one of the first. Eric wrote three, three articles on this alone. So this is <coughs> incredibly important. Okay. So the big thing to ask yourself with this is, what else must be true? I know that the player had an else bet, and I know that the player said go. And then I know that while the opponent untapped and drew his card, the player <coughs> moved the dot on his elf. Yeah, he left, but that's also a real thing. Well, I know. Yeah. So <laughs> we we want to understand what is he what is what what is this guy doing? So 
Why? Why did he move that that elf back? Right? And he, he tells you. He tells you. You know. Well, I I thought I had activated it. Okay. You thought you had activated it. Why did you think you had activated it? So we want to understand what's going on through this player's mind. Clearly, he said go because he said said he said go. He told you in his his baseline story that he had said go. And then he moves aside. And his opponent said, yeah, he told me, go. So we want to understand. Really, this one is actually more of a situation we want to understand if the player knew what he was doing was wrong. But it's, it's still very important, right? Because we have to understand what's going on through this player's mind and why is he moving this guy, right? Or do we have just a simple game rule violation? Or are we throwing this guy out? So the other thing, and and this this doesn't happen nearly as often as it really should be. Is the one of the first things that we want to do is we actually want to ask ourselves when we're presented, especially when we're presented with a situation. As at, from a floor judge. You're head judging a PBTQ, and a floor judge comes up to you and says, hey, I've got this situation, and you, your, immediate, your immediate reaction is, I'm going to throw somebody out. Well, take a second and ask yourself, what would change my mind? What, what is it that some player could tell you that would change your mind? Right? You've got a guy and he's got parts all on his sleeves. And they're all on his all on his lands. And it, it looks, yeah, whoa. It looks incredibly suspicious. All of his lands have these marks on them, and it's very consistent, same place, all the lands. You can look at the deck and you can see, right? You discover this very good deck there. What is it about this situation that would change your mind from this bottom line? Uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Yeah, we're, we're, we're there. This is this talk is stuff full of information. So sorry, I, I don't like this, this presentation mode for this. But next time I'll, I'll do a different. Um. So now we're on decision time. We, we, we made our assessment. We have all of our considerations. We've looked at the techniques that we can use to gather this information, right? We need to make a decision. Our clock is ticked, right? So, if you're the floor judge, we talk about this, there's, there, there are really two different perspectives here. You're that floor judge on that PBDQ, and you need to determine if something is sufficient so you can get the head judge. So how do you do that? Well, we've made our determination, right? We want to leave a judge at the table. If that is possible, our man over there in the end was saying, hey, we've got some extra floor coverage, we want to leave a judge there. For sure, we want to leave a judge there. And that's going to allow us to keep the situation diffused, and it's going to give us another perspective for the conversation that takes place. Because players aren't going to stop talking just because you left. How do you feel? Uh, so, uh, let's say you're at an event and somebody else is cleared into litigation and they pull you aside mm -hmm. to be that. Um, how do you feel about asking questions? Um, I don't. So, I actually don't like that. If you are, if you're the third party, um. I actually, what I like to do is I actually like to engage the players in a fun, non-investigation related topic. I don't like to ask, if, I, if I'm called over, that's a very good question, if I'm called over as a third party and there's an ongoing ruling, doesn't have to be something that's going to lead to a, 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 a disqualification, could even be an appeal. I like to engage the players and say, hey, where are you from? Oh, you're from here. How are you doing on your day? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. What's your, you know, I like to engage them in something completely unrelated. 
right? Oh, I see you're wearing the Dallas Cowboys shirt. The Dallas Cowboys lost yesterday. Da da da. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like that's use use their clothing, use their hats, use their deck boxes, and think they have stuff about them that if you're if you're observant enough, and that's what this talk is all about, is observation, you can have a separate conversation that A takes their mind off of the, the current ruling. And again, that's great because it disarms them, right? So they're going to open it up. They're going to you're going to use the, the situation, and when when the head judge comes over, they're going to have an easier time getting them to talk. Right? They're going to be more open to talk to the head judge. And again, you think about investigations. Oh man, somebody's getting disqualified. No, that's not 99% of the time. That's not the case. So. For the floor judge who is responding, you want to bring the head judge away from the table. Do not tell the head judge, I think Joe is cheating. <laughs> not good. Not good. Joe can hear you. Joe knows what's up. Sorry, Joe. You just happened to be right there in the sweet spot. So that, that's that we want we want to be back over here. We want to talk to the head judge away from the table, right? Another thing, even when we play the we pull the players away. You actually want to have the player face away from the table. That's that's an actual legitimate concern. Don't have the player face his opponent. There are people who know how to read lips. So even even for something like, hey judge, I've got a question about a card in my hand. I will face you face the table. That allows you, you can have eye contact with the table, see what the opponent is doing, so you can watch that player's stuff. You know, I've got an eye on your stuff. You can reassure the, 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 the player, hey, I've got an eye on your stuff, face me that way. You can tell them, like, look, I, you know, some players, they can read lips. That we had in Indianapolis, we actually had some players, or no, it was in DC. There were, there were three players, and they were all hard of hearing. They were all on a team, and they were all hard of hearing. Those three players can definitely read lips. <laughs> so you, ne you never know. You never know. Right? It's one of those things where, like, oh, it seems inconsequential, but it's it's really easy precaution to take. So we wanna we wanna as a floor judge, while the head judge is there. You want to, as best you can, I understand in some situations with PPTQs, there's only two judges, and you have seven different calls going off at once. As best as you can, you want to remain at the table during the process. Okay? Why do you want to do that? Well, because you, as I said earlier, are one of those three resources for the head judge. Okay? Because you are the responding judge. You got the initial story, so you have the baseline. So that information you can feed back to the head judge. And if information changes over the course of of of, of, uh, of time, you are the conduit to feed that back into the head judge. So you want to offer your input directly to the head judge. Never, never, never should you step on the head judge and go, hey, well, no, it was actually like unless they solicit you to do so. If you have additional information, you can certainly offer that. Say, oh, hey, can I, can I, can I add something? And they'll usually step you back or off. You can say, hey, uh, I've got a question. That's actually the best one, right? That's fantastic. Because then it looks like you didn't understand something, right? You put the onus on you, and it looks like you're not questioning the head judge. You're not, you're not trying to. You know, I say this like never know do this strongly, but you you should definitely want to offer your input. You are there, you're a witness, right? You you definitely want to want to want to be able to convey to the head judge what you saw and what your opinion. Yeah. Um, when you come across an investigation as a floor judge, yeah. Are there coming questions that you ask before getting the head judge, or points that how do you get there? Alright, so the first question is sort of phosphorus because it's, it's the answer is enough. Right? 
Um, you should ask enough questions till you are satisfied that either you no longer need to continue that that line, or you've exhausted all the options, um, or that you are certain that there's something suspicious going on. And the second part of your question was what again? Um, what should you avoid doing in order to avoid stepping on that that doesn't go? So, I mean, it's really easy. What you should avoid doing is you should avoid going, hey, well, th this is like just, you know, you should, it's the same thing as uh, when we're shadowing somebody. It's the exact same thing. You don't want to step on the other judge's toes, right? Hey, no, you're doing that wrong, right? That's the kind of presentation we don't really want, right? And when you're you're there, you're back, you are there, that would have made at the table to back up the head judge because again you are one of his resources, right? And when you're there as the shadow, you're a resource for that other judge. So it's actually the very similar what you're doing, right? So you don't want to jump in on him and be like, oh head judge, you're wrong because of that, right? Come in and say, oh, I've got a question and I'm not sure about this one thing that was said. Take him off to the side and be like, no, before they told me, it doesn't matter if I have a question or not, you don't really have a question. But you say, hey, look, before they told me, you know, uh, this, that, and the other thing, and now this guy's telling you something ever so slightly different. So now he has to look into that line, right? And the head judge has to make a decision that you don't want him to jump on them and offer something up, right? Because that, that may... That may tip the head judge's hand, right? Especially if we're going back to some of those things that I was talking about earlier, that you want to ask questions to know information, right? Like, those are really subtle things a lot of times. You want to ask for what else might be true. It's subtle. A lot of the times when I'm doing an investigation, I ask a question that's super general. I give this guy a little bit of rope, and I let him run. And for as much as he gives me, Right, like I got a really famous answer that I tell her uh, uh, example that I tell one time. Uh, and that is I had a player who was a deck who was at a, we were doing a deck check on him, and this player had failed to decide. So the floor judge had said, oh, okay, you're gonna get a you know, game law, game loss for failing to decide or you know, that type of penalty, da da da. And then, not satisfied with this, I said, hey, tell me about these cards. And I pointed to some of this sideboard cards. And the player said, well, my buddy and I were sitting there, and we decided to roll the die, and he rolled higher, and then he won. <laughs> Check, please. <laughs> right? Now, you ask the question, tell me about these cards. And that's the response that you get. <laughs> so you want to ask general questions. So when you jump, if your floor judge jumps in, right, and you jump in, you'd be like, hey, what about this? Right, you may actually blow that in. You may blow, and you may say, well, you know, what we're really looking at is these markings that are all on your land. And now you put the player on the defensive, and he's, he's going to play them off, and now you can't tell us that you're not going to get any information from him. Unless you do, if you do, your DQ is on very shaky draft, right? Did you have a question, Tom? Yeah, how much better would it be if the head judge, if they're walking to, to the uh, issue, if the head judge has one of the last instructions to the floor judge sat there and said, look, I'm going to talk to them when I'm done talking to them before I issue a ruling, I, I'm going to talk to you for just a second. To the, to the, to the floor judge? judge. Just, yeah, to reassure, just to reassure the floor judge, hey, I'm going to come back to you and get your input on this to make sure that we're all on the same page. Absolutely, you can you can certainly do that. I usually, before I give a ruling, I'll pull the I'll pull the floor judge aside and I'll talk to them again before I give a ruling. Uh, I don't usually say something explicit like that, but if you feel that the floor judge is is not comfortable with your, uh, you know, with how you how they receive, you, you receive their input, right, or you want to reassure them that you are absolutely considering their input, because frankly, that floor judge that came to you, that's, that's what you have to go on as a judge, that's, they're your front line, you don't know any of this until they come to you and tell you, oh yeah, this just happened, 
And that's going to get into something that I talk about a little bit later. We're all hold the questions. Uh, I've got a bunch more slides to go through. So, what makes something cheating? Right? We're, we're in this investigation talk. What are we talking about? Cheating. Players like to cheat. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. A player is about to lose. So, we come to a situation and we say, oh, this is ready to look suspicious. Why would the player cast the, uh, what's that, a glare of heresy, hasn't it? Right? Sort of. Why would a player cast on the hundred during combat on a non-white creature? <laughs> right? We can, we can consider the board state. We can consider, is this player about to lose? Right? These desperate plays, these GRBs, right? That could turn the game around, right? My that hunter hunted, right? Kill the who kill that creature, and then boom, now I don't take that combat damage, and now I'm up like four or five lists, and I I can crack back and win. Right? Mine was literally just like I just did not say how that I also main deck because I was like, wow, this card is great. Yeah, RTFC. <laughs> The other thing is we want to look at the flip side of this. A player has there's a chance to win, right? If I make this play, and can I win the game? Right? Real, real simple. Board positions, board positions, right? We absolutely want to consider board positions, right? I've got six mana in my hand, and I cast this spell at the end of your turn, and it's a sorcery, and if it goes through, I can cast my giant six casting cost plane ball instead of Ugin, right? Because Ugin would clearly win me the game if I have six six lands in play. But if I get rid of your planeswalker, I can lay mine down on my turn, right? But I don't have enough mana to be able to do both, right? So even if I draw land, I can only get set. Four moves. We can look at hands. We can look at you know, am I am I desperate? And it leads into these other two things. Am I desperate to win this game? So I'm going to lose. Right? Am I, if this, if I make this play and it's wrong, do I just simply win this game? The board position actually plays into that a lot. And, and this list is certainly not exhaustive. I'm sure you can think of other things. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna breeze through these quickly since we're getting close to time. But, we've got, a, we've got an example here where a player attacks with Goblin Landmaster and several tokens. His opponent says, Lock a token. Okay. Then, uh, Rap Master guy says, Alright, take X. And then he pulls his weight. No, no. I meant, I meant to block Rap Master. Yeah, no, shake your head. But you want to go back to what we said, and we want to understand why is this guy doing this? What, what could this guy say to change my mind? To make me not this to DQ this guy. And um, this guy, he got jealous. Because he didn't he didn't change my mind. But he understood that what he did was that he couldn't do. And he understood that this play would lose him the game. He would lose the game because X was too much. And it didn't matter. He was so far behind in the board position. Again, we want to talk back. We were talking about the board position, where we were, right? Um, so now we have a very similar example, right? We have uh, where A cat rally the answer of having five or seven lands, including all of her blue lands, and no slay A. For those of you who are familiar with our tournament shortcuts, X equals three. So N says, okay, I dispel that. A says, wait, X equals two, and I'm pulling blue blue. Because earlier in the turn, they had activated their Jace and gave their dispel flashback. Yeah, no. So this player actually uh, did not get tossed. What? What's that? Why? We can we can talk about that a little bit. Did they have a but, but again, it goes it goes back to it goes back to what I was saying earlier. What could they say to change your mind, right? What could they tell you, right, 
They don't understand that shortcut. They don't understand how that shortcut works. How can I how can I hold them to be intentionally cheating? Right? You don't understand the shortcut. Oh, I meant to do this, but I don't really understand what I was doing. Well, you're not cheating. Because you have to know that what you're doing is wrong. So here we go. During the beginning round deck check uh, at, a, at, a, at a Star City Classic, I discovered the player has two cards in one sleeve. It's very obvious, very visible. You can cut through it any time because there, these cards are not in the sleeve in any way. Um, both cards are playable in their deck, and all of the cards listed on his deck list are there with the addition of this second card that's behind them. What do you think? Well, no. Yeah. Them out? No. no, I think they just forgot to put it as part of the So, yeah, that's pretty much what happened. Is once we talked with the player, we sat down with the player, and the player was play testing some cards. And they had a bunch of extra cards that they were play testing with. And while they were swapping sleeves in the early morning, they messed up. And they had a card that was two cards in one sleeve. Especially since they were reusing sleeves. So again, go back. You got to think about. So now we have this one here. During the last round of day one of a grand free. So this is who makes it into day two. Who earns money? Players are discussing if one of them should concede to the other, and then one player flips up the top part of the library. Who here would disqualify these players? When did this happen? Before or after the change? <laughs> and uh, it, it, happened in grand, it happened in DC. Who would oh, 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 disqualify these oh, players? Who would just all I wanted to show a band who would disqualify the player? I don't know. I feel like I need to No, he purposely he purposely flipped up the card. He took the card and flipped it up. Who would disqualify the player? Alright. Several people. And, and we can discuss why later what you're wrong. <laughs> you would not disqualify the player. Um and the reason is because during their discussion, they're not actually using the information on the top part of their library. Uh, which is very important, right? If we go back to our policy, we consider our policy, they need to use the information that's not part of the If you want to know more about this particular example, again, we can talk about it. So now we're we're coming to the end here. So all of these situations are situations, all of my anecdotes and all my examples are situations that I can make. Uh, and they came up to me because, well, just we're watching watching games, right? Somebody was there, uh, the, the raffle master, there was a judge floating by, and they heard the conversation, and they came up to me and said, I just heard this conversation, and then I came over and investigated further, right? Somebody was there watching these games. So watch games, watch games, no matter. It's really important to be able to identify what you need to know and to do it quickly. Uh, you want to be able to draw your conclusions? And you can serve it professional. I would, I would say questions now, but we know we have time for it. So uh, I, 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 this is jam packed. I will be here all day long in various different rooms. So if you have any questions for me at all, be sure to ask me. And I'll be happy to cover everything and anything that you like. So thank you very much.